Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Jack Wallen. Uh, Dr. Wallen went to uh, Weber State uh, University for undergraduate and then University of Utah Medical School. Uh, he uh, then went to Vanderbilt where he was an uh, assistant professor, uh, fellow, instructor. Uh, internship and residency came next at uh, Parkland Hospital in Dallas. Dr. Wallen is very well known in this community as an excellent clinician and uh, is involved in uh, many ongoing studies and research projects. Um, also known among the residents as a very good teacher and a very popular speaker. And he's going to talk to us today about uh, tight glucose management. Dr. Wallen. I'm going to add just a little bit uh, to what Steve said, just maybe two or three points. Number one, we have data out of Intermountain Healthcare's computerized database on over 30,000 patients, obviously the uh, vast majority of them being controlled by uh, primary care, and the uh, average hemoglobin A1C actually is below 7. So we really have more than 50% of our patients with glycose below 7. And some comments about, you know, weight loss and the surgery really leading to significant improvements in diabetes, hypertension, and so on. I actually uh, directed the uh, OptiFast program for McKay a number of years ago, and basically what we saw with very low calorie diets and weight loss was that virtually every case of diabetes disappeared just within weeks, and most antihypertensives were not needed as well, and there actually was no change in the gastric tract uh, to lead to that. The problem was long-term success rates were very miserable and, and that program got dropped. So I think the specific thing about surgery is that it has much better outcomes on a long-term basis. So I think those two things are important. Um, there's been a big paradigm shift in uh, control of glycemia. I think Harry uh, recognized that and asked me to kind of review the studies that have done this. There's a lot of data. This is the most I've ever presented in a 30-minute presentation. So this is kind of a very fast overview. So there have been a number of recent trials that looked at tight control of glycemia and hard endpoint outcomes. The ACCORD trial looked at about 10,000 patients who had diabetes, average age 62. They'd had diabetes for about 10 years. If you go down about the fourth line, they came in with glycos. Um, Let's see if I can point you there, about 8.3 and achieved 6.4, although the target was actually 6. So very tight glycemic control across the board. Now what happened was, this is a very aggressive trial, and we'll go through uh, how they did this very briefly, but the uh, level of glycemia dropped precipitously, as you can see. And glycohemoglobin looks backward for three months, and despite that, about three or four months into the study, the glyco had dramatically dropped. So this study dropped blood sugars in a very fast fashion and maintained that level of glycemia over the uh, six-year period of time. Uh, looking at cardiovascular events, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, and CVD death, there was a trend to an improvement. I mean, it looks like maybe we'd have seen a positive result, but as you notice, the statistics are not significant. So I don't think we can say that we really uh, clearly benefited the patient. About a 10% trend, but not significant. Unfortunately, if you look at death rate, what happened, the death rate was actually higher and it did hit statistical significance with a p-value of 0.04, about a 22% increase in death rate. So uh, clearly something that we uh, don't want to do. Now, design of Accord was very aggressive. They were shooting for glycos below 6, and in fact, if your glyco was above 5.9, that was a reason to intensify therapy. Uh, one of the others was that if 50% of your self-monitored blood glucoses were above 100 fasting or above 142 hours after meals, 
you had to take the next step. This is called forced titration. I've been in several studies where titration was forced, but never with this kind of aggressiveness. So let me give you an example. A patient comes in and they're fasting sugar over the last four days. Two of them have been, say, 105, 120. Uh, one was 101, another sugar was 40. Would you increase the insulin overnight with somebody that just had a blood sugar of 40? In this protocol, you had to advance insulin because it met the criteria. So it took all judgment out of the investigator's hands. And the reason they did that, when you give investigators the choice, glycos have never come down to the level of six in trials. Very, very uh, aggressive uh, goal. What happened? As we mentioned, the glyco went to 6.4, but uh, down at the bottom here, severe hypoglycemia, 10.5% versus 3.5% in the control. Severe typically means that person is either unconscious or they're obtunded to the point that they can't care from the, for themselves. So it means there has to be outside intervention. This doesn't mean somebody that's very shaky or very sweaty. Severe, by definition, has very significant clinical impact. <clears throat> now, what might have predicted bad outcomes? Well, if your A1C was higher than average for the group, so higher than your A1C when you started, the worse was the increase in mortality by getting sugar lower. Also, medications, aspirin and antidepressants, I can look at aspirin and say, typically we add aspirin in people that are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease, probably had their disease longer, that might be it. Antidepressants, we know depressed patients have much worse outcomes, control, glycemia, uh, in diabetes. And history of neuropathy, again, probably says these people had more advanced disease. <clears throat> One of the intriguing things, or maybe things that are confusing is that if you plot across the bottom hemoglobin A1C, and here's a risk of bad outcome, zero being no change. Interestingly, in the intensive group, if your glyco was below seven, you actually did better. So all of the bad outcome in accord, despite it was a trial to tighten control, came in the people that had poor control. So if your glyco was up in the, oops, sorry. If your glyco was up in the seven and a half, eight, nine area, your risk was markedly higher than average. Now the people in Accord ended up saying, because it occurred at a high glyco, it can't have anything to do with hypoglycemia. With a very rigid titration schedule, I'm not certain I understand why the people were not down unless they had recurrent hypoglycemia that prevented them from getting low. So this is still a uh, unresolved issue, but in my mind, I still think that the study design may well have played a role. <clears throat> if we divide people by subgroup, uh, basically looking whether they already have coronary disease or not, the people had secondary prevention. They already had established coronary disease, actually did worse if they had lower blood sugars. Whereas the people in primary prevention who did not have coronary disease gained benefit by tighter glycemic control. So there was a significant separation there. If we look at where the baseline sugars, we already mentioned this, the higher your baseline was, the less benefit you got from tight control. So I think one of the major questions, did the protocol and accord push so hard that we had negative in outcomes in accord? And we have two other recent studies, one the ADVANCE trial, very similar in nature, another big study, about 11,000 patients, and if you look at age, they were a little older, maybe their diabetes wasn't quite as long in duration. Baseline A1Cs were a bit better at 7.5, 
and they strove for a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5 rather than below 6. <clears throat> it also took a little bit more time to drop the sugar. So uh, sugars were down a bit to begin with at six months, but really took about 36 months to get uh, the sugars down to goal. And then they were successful in maintaining that lower level of glycemic control in the intensive group. Again, the data looks very similar to Accord. If we look at uh, non-fatal MI stroke and cardiovascular death, uh, the study stayed fairly tight all the way through and toward the end looked like it was separating with a trend for reduced events in the intervention or the tight control. But clearly, again, the p-value is so high that I don't think you can make any decisions. Conversely, if you look at microvascular disease, and the two biggies are eye disease and kidney disease uh, that occur with that, the further the study went, the further those two lines diverged, and in fact, that was highly statistically significant. So we know for sure that tight control in the group as a whole did in fact decrease microvascular disease. Um, if we look at all-cause mortality, again, a trend toward improvement in this study, but no statistical significance, so it's difficult to know what that means. If we look at subgroups here, again, history of macrovascular disease, if you already have established coronary disease, you don't gain benefit by tight control, and in fact, it may increase your risk. If uh, you had microvascular disease, the second red circle, that didn't appear to change outcome. Interestingly, uh, if you're on an ACE inhibitor, then you seem to get less benefit. Maybe ACE provides some kind of protection from higher sugars. If you're off ACE, you gain benefit from tighter control. If you're treated with statins, that didn't seem to make a difference one way or the other. VADT, a similar study in the veteran population, smaller, about 1,800 patients. Uh, 60 years of age, diabetes in duration a little bit longer, 11 and a half years. Baseline A1C higher. I think in general the veterans, uh, in the past at least, have not been as well controlled. Glyco 9.4, and they chose a goal of 6 for their glycemia and actually got glycos down to 6.9. So they were not as aggressive as was uh, the Accord study. And they got down relatively quickly, probably partway in between these two studies. So they were 80 or 90 percent of the way down at six months, and the glyco uh, hit its nadir at about 24 months, and they were quite successful in holding the difference between those two groups. Now this is plotted a little different. They look at this as time to event. So you actually want to be the higher of the two lines, and in fact, the intensive group, again, had a trend to better outcomes in uh, cardiovascular events, but it wasn't statistically significant. If you look at time to death, then the trend, again, was negative for tight control. Not statistically significant, obviously very, very close, but if there was a trend, it was for worse outcomes. Interestingly, in VADT, if you separated the patients based on their coronary artery calcium score, so if you have less than 10 spots of calcium in your coronary arteries, that means you're low risk cardiovascular-wise. And if you look, there was a big difference in time to event. The tight control people did much better. So if you catch people early when they don't have cardiovascular disease, we did see a statistical improvement in how patients did. If you have moderate risk, say coronary artery calcium score of 11 to 100, <clears throat> then the trend was still the same way, but it was not statistically significant. And the two bottom panels, if you're at much higher risk, those people did not gain benefit from tight control. So if we look by age, uh, risk here at one, 
and come over, anything less than 15 years of age or 15 years diabetes duration, the risk was actually lower than one. If you were more than 15 years in, your risk of tight control actually worsened your outcome. So I think the answer or the implication from this is early treatment, we want it to be very tight. Later, once a person already has complications, some process is set up that tight control probably doesn't benefit you as much and, and may even be risky. Now there are several older trials that may give us some insight uh, to this as well. One is the Diabetes Control and Complication Trial, and in that study, after the study ended, it ended, they followed those people, and the report on that is called EDICT, and I'll show you some of that data. DCCT, they managed to drop sugars very dramatically. This was in type 1s, and back when this was done, really glycos of 9 or 10 were the norm. So it was easy to take people from there. Well, maybe I shouldn't say easy, but they were capable of taking people down to a glyco around seven. You notice at the end of the study, when the results were published, we saw an 80% reduction in microvascular events in the first eight and a half years, that what happened, the people that were in the poor control group rapidly improved their diabetic control. And the people that were tightly controlled, where nurses were calling them multiple times a week, encouraging them, helping them make decisions, didn't do quite as well. And those two curves basically ended up coming very close together. The difference in blood sugar was something like eight or 10 points different. Now, if we look at what happened in outcome, eight or nine years in for cardiovascular disease outcomes, didn't show the statistics, but there was a trend to the tight control group doing better. But if you look at statistics, the p-value was not significant. So when DCCT came out, we said tight control improves microvascular disease, but there's no evidence that it improves macrovascular events. Now in EDICT, as they followed these people, and there's no longer a difference, or at least a major difference, in their glycemic control, what you see is the event rate dramatically changed and the intensive group did significantly better. And so we had a risk reduction of 42% with a very highly significant p-value of 0.01. So clearly what we're seeing, you have a period of very tight control, you don't see much impact and now in the follow-up period when both groups are treated the same, now that difference shows up. People have put a term on that and said metabolic memory. You do something to the metabolism that sets up a abnormality that impacts you for years and years and years into the future that if you're well controlled doesn't occur. Another name for that is legacy effect and you'll see those two terms used in the literature, either metabolic memory or legacy. If we look at what happened to a non-fatal MI stroke and death, basically the same thing. Eight years out, there really is no separation in the lines, yet when they were then on controlled about the same, the two lines separate, again showing that legacy effect that something you did in the past has very significant impact on how they do in the future. About a a 60% reduction, again, with a very uh, significant p-value. Now, Steno-2, Northern European study, a little bit different. In Steno-2, not only did they try and control glycemia, they controlled blood pressure, they controlled lipids, they used aspirin, they used ACE inhibitors. It was a multifactorial intervention to see what happened when you controlled all of the things that you could do to control diabetes. Uh, about an eight-year study, and at the end, they didn't have great follow-ups, so we don't know what happened. That's why we see a dotted line. But in all probability, those two lines came together quite rapidly. More data was coming out that tight control was a benefit. When we say tight, values down around seven or below. Uh, if we look at the steno data, those two curves did start separating and favored intensive control 
right from the beginning. But if you look at the difference, it's again that same kind of legacy effect where we saw a much bigger effect out 13 or 14 years than we did at the end of the trial at eight years. So metabolically, we're setting up some process that is going to have negative outcome uh, some, <clears throat> some uh, distance down the road. If we look at death in steno, I think it's even more dramatic. So eight or nine years out, we don't see a significant change, a small trend. But as time goes on, that becomes uh, very significant. So we have uh, some studies that suggest that if you're really going to look at death, you may need to study people for quite some time. And things that you do, even after you stop, may have impact on their outcome down the line. UKPDS, a study in type 2 diabetics, and UKPDS, again, dropped glycemia. And in this case, the glyco dropped about 8 tenths of a gram percent. If you want to convert that to blood sugar levels, you're dropping the sugar by about 20 points on average. Very, at least to my point of view, a very small change in glycemia. At the end of UKPDS, again, they had a post-treatment study, and they followed people, and you see the data on the right there, that after the study ended, the two groups basically coalesced. Their glycemic control was virtually identical. And what we see, uh, as far as my, myocardial infarction, the lines took a long time to separate, but at the end, a statistically significant 15% reduction in cardiovascular events. If we look at death, clearly no impact on death until you get out probably at least 15 years or beyond, yet a 20-point drop in blood sugar by the time you get out 17 or 18 years results in a 13% uh, reduction in death rate. I take that as a fairly hard endpoint. When death rate change, I think that study probably has impact. If we plot the data from UKPDS in a different fashion, uh, basically what you see is that we see a change as blood pressure comes downward in this fashion from greater than 150 to less than 130, no matter what level of glycemia you have, you gain benefit. Looking at it the other way, if we say your pressure is above 150, bringing your sugar down continues to decrease risk, and really pretty much for all of these groups. But I think what you do see is that if you start with a high pressure and a high sugar and you reduce both, you get the biggest drop. So these two things appear to be additive in decreasing risk. On the other hand, if we look at death rate, it's a little bit different. So same kind of plot, but I think what you see, for example, if you have, oop, I did it again. If you have a glyco less than six, pressure of 130, 130 to 140, 140 to 150, not a big difference in death rate. So very tight glycemia may protect you to some degree regards hypertension and vice versa. You have very tight blood pressure control under 130, even if your glyco is less than six, six to seven, seven to eight, probably the risk of death is fairly comparable. You have to get fairly high sugars before you see an increased death rate. But as the pressure is poorly controlled, then we start seeing a significant impact of glycemia on death rate. So if you control one thing, you may reduce the impact of controlling another. We really see the same sort of thing when we look at patients that are um, treated with statins or or ACE inhibitors as well. So let me just take you very quickly through a meta-analysis of the major trials. Um, if you look at meta-analysis, lowering blood sugar, in fact, does decrease coronary heart disease about 15%. And um, looks like that probably is statistically significant when you uh, combine all of those studies. On the other hand, if we look at the incidence of death, 
Again, ACCORD and VADT are two studies that suggest a trend toward worse outcomes with tight control. Remember, both of those were striving for glycemia below a glyco of 6.0, whereas ADVANCE was trying to get glyco below 6.5. <clears throat> if we again look at whether or not patients had the presence of cardiovascular disease or not, in the whole meta-analysis, it holds up again. If you have cardiovascular disease present, you tend not to get benefit from tight control of glycemia. So I tried to tabulate this. If we look at microvascular disease, really basically all of the studies, it's questionable in accord, show a, a reduction in microvascular disease. I think the uh, strongest outcomes came here in the extension studies, EDICT and the extension of UKPDS. <clears throat> if we look at cardiovascular disease, everything was neutral except the extension studies. When you have very tight control for a period of time, then stop and have uniform between both groups and you look long term, you do decrease uh, cardiovascular disease. The uh, one clinker in mortality is the ACCORD trial where we did see a statistical increase uh, in death rate from tight control. All of the others uh, really didn't show that. So what might we say? Well, I think number one, treating diabetics well involves treating all of their risk factors not just glycemia. So we're talking about lipids, pressure, clotting, choosing drugs that are of benefit uh, regards uh, complications of diabetes. DCCT and UKPDS tend to suggest that you want to make certain you do this early on because you have long-term impact on how they do, even if they do poorly in the future. So if you have a period of very poor control, I mean, I've felt this for a long time, but didn't have the data. If somebody who has 10 or 15 years of very poor control, you bring them down slowly and control them, those people still do very, very poor. I think they have some form of metabolic memory, some legacy effect that unfortunately puts them at very high risk uh, long term. <clears throat> So we can decrease cardiovascular risk if we improve glycemic uh, control early. Uh, blood pressure and lipid control can decrease the impact of tight glycemic control. When you get them down where the risk is low, gaining control of sugar has less benefit than, than it does in people that have poorly controlled blood pressure or lipids. I think that still the appropriate goal for most people is the hemoglobin A1C below 7. <clears throat> Higher targets, obviously, from what we've shown, are acceptable for people that have cardiovascular disease, probably are old and frail, that have a shorter period of time to live. We're not going to get to the point that we will see those uh, increases in benefit. Certainly people that have recurrent significant hypoglycemia or have a hypoglycemic unawareness where they don't sense that their sugar is going low, really ought to be in the group whose glycos run higher. On the other end, probably lower targets, like the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists is pushing for less than six and a half. I think that fits the patient that is early in the course of their disease, can regiment their lifestyle so that it's not highly variable from day to day and put them uh, in a position of increased risk from uh, hypoglycemia. So uh, that would be uh, my summary of how, how I see the data at the present time. Unfortunately, I don't think that this is as clear as it might be. And uh, hopefully we'll see other uh, trial data that will uh, clear the water. So maybe we have a minute or two for questions. How aggressively to treat lipids? The question was how aggressively should uh, lipids be treated in diabetics? And I think uh, 
uh, my own personal opinion is, probably more aggressively than even the uh, recent guidelines. But certainly the guidelines say that virtually every person with diabetes ought to be on a statin. That's number one. Uh, there is data showing that even if you're starting LDL is in the uh, 90 to 100 range, adding a statin results in about a 22% reduction in death. So probably every patient with diabetes ought to receive a statin. Number two, uh, LDL goal ought to be under 100 for everyone with diabetes and anyone that's high risk, they have other risk factors other than diabetes, probably below 70. If you just saw the data using uh, a, a very potent statin in people that had low LDLs but a high HSCRP, the Jupiter trial, the median LDL was down around 50. So 50% 50 of the people had LDL cholesterols below 54, and 25% of the people had LDLs below, I think it was 46 or 45. So you can drive LDLs down. They did not see bad outcomes. In fact, that study was stopped less than two years with almost a 50% reduction in cardiovascular events. So my guess is we're going to see that lower LDL levels actually have even better outcomes. Yes? I, I'm sorry, I can't. Um, not anything that would match directly. There certainly is data risk versus weight and it's not a perfect you. So some weight gain to begin with doesn't dramatically increase your risk. And some patients have brought that to me and said, look, here's a study that shows that I can gain this much weight and my risk really isn't that much higher. The data tends to show more significant amounts of weight gain as where risk dramatically goes up whereas the data with glyco and with blood pressure appears to be for blood pressure, there are three or four studies suggesting systolic pressure clearly needs to be below 130. The Accord arm, I didn't present that today, there's a blood pressure arm, might argue against that, but I think the other data is overwhelmingly in favor of 130. So I think the data is not quite as strong on obesity. One more. On this legacy effect thing, it's not uncommon to f have a first-time diabetic come in with a hemoglobin A1C of like 10. I mean, obviously, we want to be very aggressive to get them down, but you don't know how long they've been there because, you know, they just come in and, you know, they don't, they don't get screened yearly. They just come in and say, I feel lousy. You find 10.10. I mean, my thought is to aggressively get them down because you have no idea how long they've been up. But with this study, I mean, who knows? I, I think what the study is telling us is that you want to look for endpoints for organ damage. Have they got advanced neuropathy? Have they got proteinuria? Have they got PVD? Uh, so you can certainly do that with your exam and, and have a fairly good idea from history and physical exam just in a few minutes of how much damage they have. The other is just duration of diabetes. So if they're out 15 years, they're falling in the group, that probably is higher risk. If you've got somebody that's got 15 years of diabetes and they've been very tightly controlled, boy, I, I would pour the coal to that individual and try and encourage them to continue to do well. I think the message here is for people that you really struggle and they're having hypoglycemia, you're really fighting to get their glycemia down and they've had diabetes for a while, you may want to rethink that effort. Thank you.